ahead and reward those. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our November Healthcare Principles and Practice session. Uh, we have a special guest speaker from the main campus in Memphis today, uh, Susan Scott, who has her master's uh, of nursing degree, also an RN and WOC nurse. Uh, I know Susan in her role as a quality improvement, uh, patient safety medical educator from the graduate medical education uh, programs based in Memphis. Uh, she is also uh, a Team Steps master trainer and a Six Sigma black belt and has been a retired VHA nurse for over 34 years. Uh, Susan, thank you so much for helping us with this presentation on one of the uh, key focus areas for the CLEAR program, uh, teaming and communication. Uh, on the screen, before uh, Susan gets started, you'll see the CME disclosure statement that's been provided by our statewide director, Bill Reynolds. Um, uh, if you'll take a look at this, and Bill, I think you've got um, we can put in the, a link if they want to get CME credit for any of our faculty or residents who have uh, full licenses that would like to receive CME credit. Yes, I'll paste it in at the end into the okay. chat box. So okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Susan, we'll let you go ahead and get started. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen now. And I think is this is my presentation here. Okay, so um, thank you for that introduction, Pam, and it's my pleasure to be here. Um, what we'll be doing today is uh, reviewing teamwork and communication, uh, primarily um, heavy on what is Team Steps and the strategies and tools around that particular program. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is what uh, Pam just discussed. I do have two disclosures. I am a consultant and speaker for Stryker Corporation and Monlika Healthcare. I should not interfere with this. Um, we do have five objectives today. I want to briefly talk about the regulatory issues, uh, primarily ACGME Joint Commission uh, and their um, impact of teamwork and communication on errors in healthcare. <clears throat> We're going to describe the teamworks, uh, Team Steps framework. Um, if you were to take a Team Steps training course, it would be an all day event. So this is going to be an overview of uh, teamwork and the structure. Uh, we're going to identify the role of patients and their families as part of the care team. I'll uh, talk a little bit about some studies in that regard and describe communication effects on team processes, and then look at the tools and um, strategies to improve teamwork and communication. So the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical uh, Education has identified several core competencies for residency programs that include uh, these three primarily core ones related to the talk today. And that's interpersonal and communication skills, practice-based learning and improvement, and systems-based practices. And hopefully you're already conducting root cause analysis and action where you're not only just drilling down into the issues or problems that you see in your m, &M conferences, but you're creating action plans to help address those, those problems. Uh, ACGME um, has added, updated the Clear Pathways to Excellence uh, in 2019 to uh, include teaming. Um, there are four uh, pathways under this particular um, guideline. And they state that the concept of teaming recognizes the dynamic and fluid nature of many individuals in the clinical care team that come together in the course of providing patient care to achieve a common vision and goal. So the first pathway is on interprofessional learning and teaming, which is primarily what we're doing here today. Um, we also created an escape room experience uh, that I can share with you at some point if you want to use that for your individual programs. Uh, we 
created that in Memphis with Amy Hall. You may remember Amy. Um, second one is high performance teaming processes, such as engaging in the plan of care, transitions of care conducted by residents, fellows, and faculty member, change of duty, handoffs, transfers of patients between the services and locations um, as appropriate, and the inclusion of interprofessional teams. Uh, three is patients are engaged in high performance teams. Um, they may be on advocacy committees. Uh, in the VA, we call this the voice of the customer, where we try to get feedback from patients about all aspects of their care. And then the fourth one is how well does the system or the clinical learning environment support high performance teams? Artificial intelligence is a hot topic right now. So things like decision support team, making sure you have the appropriate resources and technology to enhance your, your teamwork experience. So one of the ways that ACGME evaluates your performance is through a clear visit. This is clinical learning environment reviews. Um, it's my understanding y'all haven't had one of these yet. We've had several in Memphis and they're very eye-opening. Uh, but there are six focus areas uh, that they look at and this, diagram kind of shows the phases, uh, schematic flow of a clear site visit. Um, patient safety, healthcare quality, care transition, supervision, well-being, and professionalism. So in 2021, they published the report of findings, and they found some significant deficiencies in several areas. Um, one particularly was event reporting, particularly reporting near misses and close calls. So I like to tell my residents unsafe conditions just report unsafe patient safety conditions in your incident reporting system. Um, root cause analysis, those were only being um, conducted in 42% of the programs. Uh, quality improvement project work, 78%, 78.9% were doing QI work, but only 8.6% was related to uh, healthcare disparities and less than 50% were related to priorities of the clinical site. Um, understanding patient safety terminology, that's been an issue since the first site visit. Um, in the procedural um, clear review uh, report, timeouts in the procedural areas were uh, problematic. They weren't being conducted for bedside procedures or think about if you're a patient in an orthopedic clinic and you're about to have your knee injected. Uh, timeouts weren't being conducted in those types of scenarios. The handouts, um, the majority of the handouts had a written handout procedure, but only uh, less than 68% had uh, no standard or 68% reported no standard for the handoff process. So that's one of the areas I wanna focus on a little bit today. Um, our ultimate goal for patient safety is to promote high reliability. And you may have heard this term before, high reliability organizations. Um, these are organizations where leadership have a commitment to zero patient harm. And that's from the top to the grassroots and everybody in between. They want to promote this safety culture and um, with trust and accountability, uh, identify unsafe conditions, strengthen your systems, and perform assessments of your environment. They participate in robust process improvement methods. Um, you think about lean methodologies. One of the things on this slide you'll see is CRM tools, that's crew resource management. Uh, this is a, a key component of team steps and came out of the military. In the VA, we did crew resource management training with our operative team um, and an entire auditorium of nurses and physicians and uh, clinicians from all operative areas participating in a day long training that included looking at briefs and debriefing and uh, our checklist and, and all the tools that are, are listed here. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, HSRD, that's the Health Service Research and Development. Development Department. They recently uh, published an evidence brief on implementation of high reliability organization principles. And they describe transdisciplinary teams um, that incorporate this uh, team training and crew resource management 
into their daily safety huddles. And this is kind of what I was talking about with the OR and the, the people attend training sessions together is not so. So teamwork does make a difference in patient safety. And when the team is performing at peak, they share a common purpose. Uh, they have clear roles and responsibilities and expectations. The leadership is expect, accepted and we have effective patient safety processes such as timeouts and handoffs. There is excellent collaboration and communication between the physicians and nurses, MD to MD and between the specialty services and it demonstrate, demonstrates mutual respect. Uh, if this is broken, patient safety is compromised. And this is where we must focus our energy. So the Joint Commission has uh, continually monitors adverse events and sentinel events. And they have identified that teamwork and communication failure is one of the leading causes of adverse events in healthcare. 70% of adverse events are related to poor or lacking communication. And um, this particular uh, slide shows the root causes of Sentinel events in 2015. And we know that an average academic medical center may have over 4,000 handoffs every day. Did you know that? Um, but there are few standardized methods for handoffs. And this data shows that human factors, leadership, and communication were the top three items that contributed to patient harm in a clinical setting. This is the most recent data on Sentinel events from the Joint Commission, and it includes um, falls, um, un uh, unretained foreign objects, suicide, wrong surgery, and delays in treatment is uh, one that's probably more specific to this particular uh, audience. And you can see that communication failures are in there as well. Okay, I did create a, uh, and my team created a curriculum blueprint uh, for ACGME that kind of outlines uh, the objectives and courses to take. And communication and teamwork is number one. There are multiple uh, strategies and tools that uh, feed into this particular work. ACGME states residents must demonstrate interprofessional and communication skills that result in the effective exchange of information and collaboration with patients, their families, and health professionals. That's one of the core competencies. Um, so one of the things that you want to do is start your assessment of your current state. And then from there, you're going to create uh, an action plan. So hopefully this will be the next step after we have this discussion today. You wanna to recognize those opportunities to improve patient safety, uh, assess your current uh, culture. Hopefully you're participating in the AHRQ safety service to get data on barriers and further actions, uh, implement QI projects to improve your competencies. Um, hopefully you're doing simulations or uh, that type of activities for difficult situations and integrating team steps into your daily practice. This is how we help to promote this culture. So let's go to some of the team steps uh, criteria. And first is your team structure. Um, the team structure refers to the composition of an individual team or a multi-team system. It's an integral part of the teamwork process. And a properly structured patient team is an enabler for effective communication, leadership, situational monitoring, and mutual support. Um, what defines a team? A uh, team is two or more individuals who in interact uh, dynamically, interdependently, and adaptively toward a common goal. And they usually have a time-limited membership. <laughs> in your case as resident, you hope so. You want to graduate here at some point. Uh, some of the newer research is on team science. I found this to be interesting. Um, this is when we have scientific collaboration, um, specifically research conducted by one or more individual or by small teams or larger group teams. Um, the effectiveness and performance of the team is related to uh, 
um, its capacity to achieve its goal and improve outcomes. And I, I can think from my own um, practice, I'm a wound ostomy continence nurse and I've worked for several years, uh, maybe a couple decades now on perioperative pressure injury prevention. And we conducted research with the OR team at Memphis, um, the OR staff, nurses, residents, uh, physicians, anesthesiology, pre and post-op. And out of that research, we created some actions around risk assessment and skin bundles for the OR that's um, significantly improving patient safety outcomes. So, what comprises team performance? Well, it's your knowledge. It's what you know and what you think and your uh, skills, what you do, your competencies and your attitude and how that fits into the bigger picture. So I want you to utilize the chat now. We're gonna have uh, about three or four of these questions. So I want you to think of the best team that you've ever worked on uh, in your career and just throw a characteristic or two into the chat. What's a characteristic of a strong team? A second to fill that out. Clear roles and good communication. Absolutely. Respect. Absolutely. That's a that's uh, mutual respect is a key component of a safe environment. Okay, you can go ahead and uh, fill those out. Respect and intentional inclusion. Excellent. And we'll go on. Y'all be thinking and filling that out because we'll save the answers. Okay, so the next step of teamwork is partnering with the patient. So it's critical to acknowledge that a patient care team is not complete without the patient. Their families should be embraced and valued as contributing partners to patient care. Uh, we want to include them in bedside rounds and we'll discuss the uh, IPASS study here in a minute. Uh, conduct patient ha handoffs at the patient bedside, include them, with, uh, include them with tools for communication in their care team. There may be some language barriers or literacy barriers, so you have to address those types of things uh, when you're dealing with certain um, patient families and populations. You want to involve them in those key committees, if possible, and enlist their participation. Um, the clinical team needs to really embrace the patient family and um, listen to their values and beliefs. Um, what is important to them? What is their preferences, their concerns? Speak to them in layman's terms so that they understand what you're talking about. Um, allow time for them to ask questions, ask for their feedback, do they understand? This is a good time to do teach back or read back, that closed loop communication and encourage them to actively participate in care. They have a responsibility to provide you with accurate information. And from my experience being a nurse for many, many decades, patients tend to want to kind of fib a little bit on how well they're doing with their medications or diet or exercise or whatever. So you're kind of like many James Bonds 007 trying to pull out that information from them. So you get the accurate picture of what's going on. Um, they need to comply with your prescribed plan of care. They need to voice any concerns and ask questions. Um, they need to report any changes in their condition that could be detrimental. They need to know what those changes are to report. And um, include their family where they can and follow your instructions. So in healthcare, we often have this multi-team system for patient care. And the core team is uh, the one that provides the direct care of the patient. This is the physicians and nurses and um, consult teams. And they're responsible for patient management from admission to discharge and or disposition if they're transferred someplace else. Contingency teams are formed for emergent or specific events such as a code team, uh, disaster response team, rapid response team. And these are generally members of a core team that's been put into the variety of these contingency teams. 
Um, the continuing or co coordinating teams, they help with day-to-day -day operations. Um, and these are people like your charge nurse, nurse managers, administrative assistant or unit clerk, whatever you call it there at Erlinger. And they manage the oper operational environment and they support the core team. And then you have your ancillary and support services. And this may be one area that you have to uh, look at to, op to optimize to help you with your plan of care. And this is like lab and x-ray and pharmacy, radiology, uh, even housekeeping, sterile processing, uh, biomechanical engineering, and human resources. And last but not least, uh, we have the uh, administrative team. And administration is, or the leadership, they are critical to high reliability. Um, they provide resources, support, they set the vision, um, define policy, monitor patient safety reports, and they charter quality initiatives. They have the resources to make the change happen. So you need to have them uh, in every uh, project, as least, at least as communication goes, that you're trying to um, implement but before it will be successful. So again, here's one more question here. Um, what are the barriers that you have identified to your team performance? And again, I will uh, give you a second to put that in the chat box. See what we come up. Give me one. Well, I know that some of the barriers that uh, we have had is the inclusion, where we don't always include the right people to the table. In the operating room, um, you may have a great plan, but you may not include um, a key player like anesthesia or the uh, residents. Um, someone here put fear. There's a term in term use uh, in um, patient safety called psychological safety. We have to have the ability to report open, open and honest information. Um, the fear of retribution, ridicule, that's uh, not the types of, of principles or a just culture that we're looking for. Okay, we'll move on. Y'all can think about that one. Next, we're going to move a little bit into communication. And these are the team step slides, and they include the cute little penguins, and there's a lot of fish and ice in here, so they're kind of cute. Um, so communication, uh, in general, is vital for patient safety. We have already talked about, you know, communication is responsible, poor communication is responsible for the majority of our adverse events. Uh, it enables the team to effectively relay information, and it's the mode that which most team step strategies and tools are executed. So there's a lot of strategies around uh, communication in this presentation. So let's uh, look at some of those. Um, it is the lifeline of the core team. We use communication, like we said, 4,000 times in, in a day uh, in healthcare. And it's only really effective when it permeates the entire aspect of an organization. You think about successful programs or ones that have strong marketing teams where everybody understands what the goals are and the objectives and, and what you need to accomplish. Um, we don't need to assume anything. We have to be aware of fatigue and distractions and HIPAA violations when we're looking at our communication processes. Those are, can, can be particular barriers. Um, the standards for effective communication are fairly simple. We want it to be complete, um, that communicates all relevant information. Um, it doesn't need to be a dissertation. Uh, it, uh, the information is clear, it's plainly understood, it's brief, presented in a concise manner, and it's timely. Offer and request information in an appropriate time frame. 
and you verify the authenticity or validate the acknowledgement uh, of information. Um, that's kind of that read back, teach back. One of the um, things I always teach my students and residents is that when you're looking at communication, you want to verify the information and then trust the source. And I recently did this talk in urology in Memphis and they said, no, it's trust no one. <laughs> I thought that was a little harsh, but you know, you need to be able to trust the communication that you're getting. So I guess their, their the point was that you need to really verify and validate the knowledge like it says here in Penn State. You want your uh, communication to be brief, clear, and timely. And there are a lot of challenges that can present here. We talked a little bit about language barriers. We have multiple distractions. Um, the physical proximity, you may have attendings at home or some in the ED and some in other settings. Um, we have all, we have personalities, the workload, the various communication styles, conflict. We'll talk a little bit about conflict resolution later, um, but uh, the verification and then the changes of shift are, can be problematic when you're in a hurry to try to get out of a setting. So some of those, these are some of the strategies. Um, SBAR, you've probably heard of that. That's typically used in nursing and um, Joint Commission will look for this. Situation background assessment recommendation. That's a quick way to identify what's going on with a particular patient. Um, call outs, uh, check backs, and handoffs. We'll talk about that. And then we have, um, oh, I see a typo. Apologize for that. Uh, we have IPASS, which is what we recommend in uh, graduate medical education as a structured, standardized handoff communication tool. Um, a call out is a strategy that communicates important information. This is like if you have an emergency situation or a code where somebody takes the lead and they're calling out who's doing what at the particular time. Uh, check back is uh, closed loop communication. I know you've heard that term. And that's where you give a message, uh, the receiver accepts the message and uh, provides feedback confirming it. And then they verify that the message was uh, received. So we ensure that uh, understood what was going on. And then handoff is the transfer of information during transitions of care across the continuum. And uh, ACGM has published a whole um, chapter on this. It includes the opportunities to ask questions, clarify, and confirm. And I think this is what we just said, transfer responsibility, clarify information. Okay. So IPASS, uh, these are the key data elements for IPASS. It's illness severity, patient summary, to-do list, or your action list, um, situational awareness and your contingency plan and synthesize, synthesis by the receiver, your read back or teach back. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail uh, on this because you've already done it. And I found a wonderful video on YouTube from Dr. Carey, and it was a HPP conference back in March. And if you haven't viewed it, I would strongly suggest that you go back and review this information because he did an excellent job uh, explaining the entire process. And uh, there was only 87 views. So I think uh, we can increase that number there. And the link is here on this slide and it's also in the references, which I will send you after the fact. So there've been several studies uh, about IPASS. It's been around since about 2015 and there Original study by Starmer uh, demonstrated a 23% uh, reduction in adverse events. This is the follow up to that Starmer study was the patient family centered IPASS study group. Um, this was back from a couple of years ago and they actually did team rounds using IPASS um, with this bi-directional communication with patient and family. Um, they had a harmful errors decrease by 38% across seven North American academic hospitals after implementation, uh, but their overall errors did not change. They're still having errors, okay? We still will have errors in healthcare. And the family experience and communication was very, was positive. 
and they anticipated that there would be pushback or negative impacts on RAM duration or teaching, but, but there really wasn't. And I found that to be interesting. It didn't really take a lot, a lot more time than what they anticipated. Uh, this was the most recent study I found uh, from 2021, and it was uh, specific to neurosurgery. So they used the IPASS model and applied it to a service. And um, this one, they did surveys before of the current state, and then they did surveys after of the implementation. And there was improvements in all areas. You see the handouts were more organized, went from 17% to 69%. They were more efficient, uh, 27 to 72%. They were more comprehensive. Uh, they were safer. They demonstrated improved teamwork. The intraoperative events, I thought this was interesting, went from 52.9% to 100%. And all of these were statistically significant in this particular study. Um, with the key values 0.001. The mean handoff time was 4.4 minutes. So again, uh, not a big uh, stretch on your time in order to do safer so the last question here, and I think I may skip this one since I won't, don't want to run out of time, but I do want you to think about what is your biggest communication barrier or challenge in your practice? And which of these team steps, tools, or strategies might you consider implementing to address the issue? If you want to, you can go ahead and put that information in the chat and we can um, copy that and send it out to everyone later but I'm gonna move on in, uh, for sake of time. So this is a bit of a uh, summary of uh, the tools and strategies that we kind of discussed, um, the barriers that we may see in our clinical setting. You've mentioned some of these already. There may be a few here you haven't thought of. Some of the tools and strategies include the SBAR call out and handout. And some of the outcomes is that shared mental model and adaptability, making the team more oriented and mutual trust, patient safety. So I wanna go over these last two or three concepts just so you're aware of them. Um, situational monitoring is basically the attention to detail. It's a continuous process. Again, we have um, a situation that the individual looks at, develops their skills or uses their skills to look at. And um, they uh, have an individual outcome and then they share that mental model with the team outcome. So it's, it's a continuous process. And I think about uh, the shared mental model is when your team is in sync and you're on the same page Teams that perform well hold shared mental models. You know, you're not going in different directions. You're working in sync in order to get um, the job done. Um, it's a knowledge of the situation or the process that's shared among the team members. And situational awareness is knowing what's going on and anticipating what could happen next. And it's critical to acknowledge that um, the patient care team is not complete without this without the patient. The patients and families should be embraced and valued as these partners in their care. And probably the best example <laughs> to me personally of situational awareness is, is John Morant. Um, he's a basketball player in the NBA for uh, the Memphis Grizzlies. And when John Morant is in the paint, he has got the most pristine situational awareness. He is surrounded by bigs. He anticipates every move that they're gonna make, it makes a counter move. And then he finds a way to score only, and he's only like six foot three. So he is the ultimate <laughs> example of situational awareness to me, where you take your skills and you anticipate and you make success out of what could happen next. Um, mutual support is the um, essence of teamwork. Um, it protects the team members from work overload, and that's extremely difficult during uh, the times now of COVID. We want to make sure that we can offer support to each other, ask for help, offer help, 
um, give support, is particularly if you don't feel safe or you feel that the situation is not safe, um, you can you should ask for task assistance. The last concept is advocacy, assertion, and conflict resolution. And advocacy is just uh, that it is uh, advocating for your patient. Um, you may not have uh, the same viewpoint on your team, but you should communicate uh, this, this um, um, views in uh, when you're making decisions in a respectful manner, firm and respectful manner. And the assertiveness statement is about respect and asserting authority. Uh, I took an assertiveness training as a young nurse way back in the day, and it was probably one of the most important courses of my career I can think of. It had the biggest impact moving forward because you need to be able to give your opinions, speak up, and present your information without feeling reprisal, if that makes sense. You want to share your concerns and suggestions, and it's then a, you don't want to have that psychological threat hanging over you. So you make an opening, you state the concern, what is the problem, offer a solution. Uh, I, I had a physician boss once that always said, you know, you don't come to my office with problems. You come to my office with two solutions, and then I'll help you decide which one's the better one. Uh, and then you reach an agreement with that. There's a couple of different ways to handle conflict. Uh, the two challenge rule is usually for information, and the desk script is for personal conflict. And the two challenge rule is making sure that you're heard. Um, it's uh, your responsibility to assertively voice your concern at least two times to make sure that you're being heard. And if you're not getting the resolution that you want, uh, you may have to take a stronger course of action. If, uh, you may have to go above the attending, heaven forbid, uh, to a faculty member if this is a problem that uh, can't be solved uh, within the two of you. Um, you may have to use a, a supervisor or someone else to help you solve this particular problem. You want to empower any member of your team to stop the line. They learned this in the Toyota production system, in lean methodology, and particularly in the aviation industry when the co-pilots would speak up, but the pilot would ignore their warnings and they ended up having some plane crashes because of that. So we don't want to, we don't want to go there, but you need to be comfortable enough to speak up and say, whoa, let's, let's wait a minute. Uh, time out <laughs> I have, before uh, you move on to make sure that you resolve the safety issue that's at hand. Um, I know uh, you all know how to cuss and you probably, uh, but this is not uh, inappropriately, but this is appropriately cussing. We're, uh, it's allowed. Um, and this is, to me, this is one of the important things to know is that when you hear these terms, I'm concerned, I'm uncomfortable. This is a red flag. This means that someone on your team has identified something that they're not comfortable with. And this can be a safety issue. Your patient may take this a step further and say, I'm scared. Uh, I'm concerned about my child. So those are things that should be a red flag to you to say, hey, this requires just a bit more of attention from my end. And a constructive approach in uh, uh, that, helps to resolve this conflict is called the DESC script. Um, it's D-E-S-C, D describe the specific situation, express your concerns about the action, suggest alternatives, and the consequences should be stated. And ultimately you, will have, you should reach a consensus. Um, you wanna have a timely discussion discussion. You don't want this to sit and fester for days and days. Preferably, this is done under behind closed doors in a private area, not in the nursing station where everybody can see what you're talking about. Uh, frame the problem in the terms. In my experience, I have noticed that 
um, when we do this, it could be problematic. We had an issue. Don't use I, use I statements. <laughs> don't, don't say you, you did this or you did that. That's very, uh, it, it's a blaming type of culture and it makes the per person feel very defensive. I feel uncomfortable when this occurs. Remember you're, you're critiquing, you're giving feedback. You're not criticizing the person. It's business, it's not personal. Focus on what is right and not who is right. Um, and this is what helps us to achieve this collaboration. Um, it's a mutual, mutual satisfying solution resulting in the best outcome. Everybody, it's a win-win situation in other words. And it helps us with our commitment to our mission meet our goals without compromising our relationships because you, you have to work with these people for a long time. So you don't want to alienate them. Collaboration, it's a process. It's not an event. Um, so here's a summary of some of the things that we discussed, some of our barriers to mutual support. Um, you can see some of those there. These are some of the strategies that we just talked about. And these are some of our specific outcomes. So I just want to close by saying culture change, it's hard. Change in anything is very difficult, but it's necessary to create high reliability processes. Um, residents, fellows, faculty, you must address the barriers to communication and teamwork in your clinical learning environment. And this is um, I got this slide from an IHI conference uh, just this last year. I attended the virtual conference. So the National Patient Safety Foundation conference is teamed with uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And if you have an opportunity to go, uh, some of your faculty or, um, or staff, you should because it's, a, it's an excellent event. So they talk about st setting the stage, uh, pulling your team together, um, creating that sense of urgency. We need to get this done now and we need to get it done efficiently. Decide what you want to do. We have this saying in quality, how do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time. Um, you want to develop your strategy and, and your vision, but you want to make it narrow enough that you can actually make it happen. Um, you want to communicate with everyone so that you get that buy-in from people. You're going to have some people that will when you introduce new practices, they're going to say, uh, you know, we've always done it that way. I'm not going to change. But you want to try to buy in as many people as possible. You want to empower your team, like the stop the line to get them involved in the process and produce these short term wins, um, things that you can say, yay, we were successful in this. OK, let's keep moving. And you don't want to give up. Um, I could have given up 20 years ago or 10 years ago on pressure injury prevention in the operating room, but it's still growing. Uh, and I like the term pleasantly persistent, so I don't ever give up. And once you get your actions in place, you need to make it stick. Um, you're creating that new culture, uh, implementing uh, guidelines into the electronic me medical record where it's the standard of care instead of who did it this way next time or, or whatever. And with that, I will open it up for questions and comments. And I appreciate you allowing me the time today to talk to your group. Uh, this is Pam, Susan. Thank you very, very much. Hopefully someone will either speak up and uh, ask a question or enter one in the chat. Um, Bill Reynolds, our statewide CME director, has put a link to the form um, that must be completed if you need CME credit for those of you who hold a uh, full Tennessee license and want to get credit but I'd love to hear if there are any ideas or questions. Comments? Was that helpful?
I think so. Um, and we will make this recording available uh, to all of our faculty and residents. We'll send uh, an email with the link directly to our YouTube uh, channel in this particular recording. We appreciate your allowing us to do that, Susan. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, I did include uh, on the last slide the references for this presentation with the appropriate links. And I will send that in a separate document so that you can click on those for um, further information. Because like I said, for this presentation for today was just a brief overview. There are literally uh, tons of um, resources and information around this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. And, and I'll make that uh, this document available once I get it from Susan. Uh, we've got a question uh, in the chat. How do you assess psychological safety? Hmm. Any ideas? Uh, probably one of the physicians would be able to answer that uh, better than me. I think from a data standpoint, it would be how many in, um, incident reports that you get. Um, I know that some of the, they talked about this at the IHI conference, that they actually track the incident reports, close calls, near misses uh, from the residency programs. And what they want to see is an increase in the numbers of those reports. Um, not to say that there's more errors. You know, we talked about the IPES study that actually there was no change in the errors, whatever. But when we feel free to report those uh, without fear of reprisal, then that can be a metric to kind of demonstrate our, um, our comfortable, uh, be more comfortable with reporting issues. Another thing I've used in our uh, GME program is um, for several years, uh, not the last couple of years because of COVID obviously, we did the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, Patient Safety Survey and had, uh, I had the residency programs, fellows, faculty actually uh, complete it separate from the hospital. Your hospital may already have that data. And if they can pull it out by residency, that can let you know. And I will tell you that one of the things that we identified was that um, our safety culture, which is, one of the findings in the ACGME Clear Report, our safety culture uh, is not as um, uh, inviting as we would like for it to be. It's always a work in pro process. So um, it's usually less than 60% of the residents feel like that they could um, report things. And depending on what the reports uh, show at your facility, it may be different based on if you're a resident, a fellow, or faculty. In our scenario, the faculty thought they were doing a great job and the residents uh, thought that it was lacking. So there was obviously a disconnect. So some of the training that we developed uh, and tools that we developed for the future moving forward address those gaps in that survey report. So that may be one way that you can put a number on measuring psychological. Good question. Thank you. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Okay. Well, I won't uh, take any more of your time. I want it noted that I finished 10 minutes early. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> My hat is off to you, okay? And as you can see, it's a beautiful downtown Memphis behind me. And as we say in Memphis, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I hope you have a great day and a great week. And um, congratulations on your journey toward high reliability. And let me know if there's any other things I can do to help you meet those goals. And okay. I appreciate you very much. Okay, Susan, thank you again. We really appreciate it. 
I'm sure I'll stay in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye-bye.